Good afternoon. I'm Gene Polosinski, Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the First Amendment Center at the Museum and at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Welcome to the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Theater at the Museum for the fifth annual Supreme Court Fellows Program Alumni Association event here. The Museum and the First Amendment Center are, are particularly pleased to host this, these annual discussions given the strong reliance on an independent judiciary to protect those 45 words and five freedoms in the First Amendment, which we hope you notice the modest little 74-foot stone tablet on the front of the building with those words engraved, just in case you happen to go by on your way to or from the court. Um, and of course, today's subject is particularly appropriate, how the media, the news media reports on the Supreme Court. Our moderator for this afternoon's discussion is Jim Duff, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum and CEO of the Museum and the Diversity Institute. Now in this room today, he may actually be better known for his roles with the court. From 1996 to 2000, Jim served as Counselor and Administrative Assistant to Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist and as Counsel to the Chief Justice in the Presidential Impeachment Trial in 99. Jim most recently served until 2011 as Director of the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts and that's a period during which the AO's office continued what is now a 13-year partnership with the First Amendment Center in something that we jointly call the Justice and Journalism Program, in which both journalists and judges seek to impro improve the flow of information to the public about the workings of the federal courts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Duff. Thank you very much, Gene. It's a real pleasure to be with you and be back with the Supreme Court fellows again. We're so glad you're uh, joining us here at the museum. It's a great uh, combination of uh, uh, things that I've worked on in the past and it's so good to combine the two of them here today. We have a very distinguished panel of journalists who covered the court for many years uh, individually and collectively and uh, they are among the, the, the best to cover the Supreme Court, certainly in my experience, having worked up there and worked in the court system. Uh, all three here with us uh, this afternoon are very highly respected uh, among their colleagues and uh, also, just as importantly, I think, by those uh, who serve in the judiciary. Um, and that takes some doing to build that trust and maintain their objectivity and all three have done just superb jobs at that. To my immediate left is Joan Biskupic. I've known Joan for many years, certainly since 1989 when she started covering the Supreme Court. She's authored uh, two judicial biographies and an American original, The Life and Constitution of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, and also a biography on Sandra Day O'Connor. She joined Reuters in February 2012 as legal affairs editor in charge, and she was previously the Supreme Court reporter for USA Today and the Washington Post. Uh, to her left is Pete Williams, uh, a good friend uh, over the years. Uh, Pete has covered the Supreme Court and the Justice Department for NBC News since 1993, uh, and he's covered the Department of Homeland Security since its creation, uh, September 11, 2001. He started his career in, in the Washington, I didn't know this actually until I got prepared um, for, for this afternoon, but he started his career as a legislative uh, assistant and press secretary for then Congressman Dick Cheney. Uh, and he served as a Pentagon spokesman during the Persian Gulf War uh, before taking his current post as NBC's senior correspondent uh, at the Supreme Court. And to Pete's left is Jess Braben. Uh, Jeff is a relative newcomer in this crowd to covering the Supreme Court. He started uh, doing that uh, in nine, uh, five years ago, I believe, wasn't 2005. it? 2005. 2005. And he covers the Supreme Court for the Wall Street Journal uh, after earlier stints uh, as United Nations correspondent and editor of the Wall Street Journal, California Weekly. He is author of Squeaky, The Life and Times of Lynette Alice Fromm, and he's just published uh, an account of military commissions trials at Guantanamo Bay called the Terror Courts. And he's available to sign copies of that for you if you like. Uh, <laughs> uh, I told him I'd give him a plug for that. Well, uh, let's get started, Joan. You started in 1989. Pete, you started covering the court in 1993. 
Uh, Jess, you started, as mentioned, in 2005, so that's a combined 52 years of coverage of the Supreme Court. Most of it Jones. Most of it Jones, <laughs> most of it Jones, and uh, you know, I, I thought about this, and we really could have saved money by just having Lyle Denniston here, because he's covered the court for 54 years, uh, but we get three for the almost the price of one with the, with the three of you. Um, I remember fondly days uh, working at the court and, and, uh, uh, and the lunch hour and going down to the cafeteria. Do you still gather there routinely uh, when you're covering the court? Uh, is it still a gathering point for journalists to, uh, to talk about uh, the, the day's activities and the cases that have been argued? Joan? Well, we really can't do that as much anymore. It used to be, as, as Jim suggested, that we would cover the oral arguments in the morning or uh, get an opinion in the morning, and then we'd be able to actually eat together at noon and then you know, finish our day filing to our uh, respective news organizations uh, you know, at four or five or even later. Now, we all try to get the news online almost immediately in one uh, form or another, and I, don't, I think we've made up um, other ways to be collegial. I mean, we still go to conferences together. Uh, all three of us will often be in email contact. And really, it's, uh, I'm the one who's probably pulled off the most from the daily business because now I don't cover it on a daily basis. I'm more now doing longer range stories. But I would say not a day goes by that I'm not in email contact with one of my colleagues. But that kind of just chewing the fat over lunch uh, doesn't happen, unless you guys are doing it without me. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it, Joan. Uh, <laughs> I think that it's, it, there is a truism about Washington that the uh, press corps takes on the characteristics of the institution that it's covering. So the White House press corps, everything is political. If they're going to change the color of the drapes in the dining room, then there is obvious political significance. It's some sort of a tea party thing. Uh, at the State Department, it's all nuance. Uh, reporters will say to the briefer, uh, yesterday, in regard to our policy on Myanmar, you said we were concerned. Today, you say we're worried. Why the big change in policy? <laughs> uh, and at the Supreme Court, it is very collegial. Um, it's true that we don't have quite the, uh, the luxury of spending as much time yammering with each other, but we still do it. We still gather in the press room after oral argument, not immediately, because we're all huddling in our keyboards, but we, you know, we talk among ourselves, because Unlike other beats, the Supreme Court is not a source beat. Uh, at least it's not for me. Uh, <laughs> um, we don't, uh, we don't, the justices don't tell us what they're going to do. The clerks don't leak to us. It's a firing offense to talk to journalists. So we're all kind of, in a sense, on equal footing. We see the cases coming. We see the briefs filed. We listen to the argument. We read the opinions. And so we don't compete in that sense to sort of outsource each other as you do find in other source beats in town, certainly at the White House, uh, you know, maybe the State Department, Capitol Hill. It's different at the court. So the art of covering the Supreme Court, if you will, and these are two of the most accomplished artists, uh, is how you describe, what significance you put, you know, putting the pieces together in a way that's understandable. Uh, so we like to talk to each other about this. Jess, what's your experience been with? Well, you know, when, uh, I, when I arrived, one of the, the, the immediate rituals after an argument was to uh, compare notes and make sure that everyone agreed on the quotations from oral arguments. Because <laughs> at that time, the court still does not permit uh, recording equipment in the courtroom, and uh, there was no other way until the transcripts were released at the uh, end of the term uh, to be sure what exactly uh, had, been, had been said. And then when the, uh, when the uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts came in, he actually uh, granted what had, uh, I learned had been a longstanding request of the press corps there, which was to issue same-day transcripts uh, from the court. And that uh, eliminated uh, uh, that, that uh, immediate necessity. So that reason, simply to make sure that uh, if we were wrong, we were all wrong, <laughs> and, and no, one, no one could be singled out for screwing up the, the argument coverage, that, uh, uh, you know, that was relieved a, a slight bit. Uh, but uh, yes, there is a you know yeah it's like it's it's like uh, you know uh, uh, children uh, you know copying what they see the grown ups do. We go down to the press room and sort of discuss how the case is going to you know come out. Uh, you know we all take our first vote and uh, you know circle the table. That sort of thing. <laughs> uh, so yes, that's uh, that's pretty much it. And and I mean there are ways that one can be competitive on this beat. There are are, are certainly a lot of dimensions to that, but not in really what you you know sort of the the, the baseline. 
uh, argument coverage or decision coverage uh, or cert petition coverage. That stuff is pretty much out there to see, and there are, I think, several uh, other angles that, that, that we each pursue uh, to try to distinguish uh, or you know, follow our, our own particular uh, uh, news interests and, and judgment. Well, if the conversation back in the green room is any indicator, the three of you are having a very interesting conversation back there about uh, arguments. Uh, it's confidential. It's, it's confidential. <laughs> we won't, we won't uh, spill that. But I, it, was, it was interesting to me to just stand back and observe um, uh, not only the collegiality in, in involved in it, but uh, the, you know, the high-level exchange of ideas about, uh, about the arguments. What um, uh, challenges have you, have you seen over the course? Is it more challenging, less challenging now? You mentioned some advantages just uh, uh, about the same-day transcripts, but uh, is, in your experience, Joan, is this uh, current court uh, more or less challenging to cover than uh, in years past? Well, it's more exciting in some ways because it's so active. It, we've all heard the expression, a hot bench, and we know that uh, even you know, yesterday was an incredibly vigorous, uh, at times very tense and testy uh, exchange up there, but most of them are now these days quite vigorous. So that's, it makes for a lot of drama in the oral argument stories. And think of the cases we've had recently. Uh, you know, healthcare last year, this year on the same-sex marriage issue and the Defense of Marriage Act and also on uh, the huge voting rights question that we had yesterday. So in some ways, this contemporary court has given us much more material and it's been good political material. All three of us really like to be able to add a political element to our stories. Uh, I, I think what people come to this beat and they don't leave. We also think we're appointed for life. <laughs> and what makes it fun is that we, it's also intellectually stimulating. What Jess was referring to in terms of how we try to distinguish um, uh, uh, ourselves individually is through what we sometimes will call conceptual scoops, mm -hmm. looking at uh, patterns, looking at trends or, uh, that step back and try to give you all and our listeners and readers uh, a plus factor or say out of yesterday's oral arguments, you know, a lot of the stories could be very standard, but maybe we, we each would try to bring something different that again would reflect how many years we've been doing it or just something that we might see that uh, a newcomer to the beat wouldn't see. Mm -hmm. One thing that's happened with the same day transcripts and the intense coverage from bloggers is that now lots of people are covering the court in different ways. And uh, you know there is a value uh, to being around for the precedent, to having covering it for a long time and, and know certain nuances. And that's again something that we can add that someone just reading the transcript in New York right. and blogging about that won't be able to add. Right. right. Um, it, by the very nature of the court's term and the, and the difficulty of uh, and challenges of some of the decisions that they have to make. Um, there is generally uh, every uh, end of the term sort of a, um, uh, a set of cases that come out at the very end. Probably some of the more difficult decisions uh, come out all at the end of the term. Does that present any particular challenges to, to you in covering uh, the court to get stories right on so many uh, higher profile cases, let's call them, uh, toward the end of the term? Does that uh, present particular challenges. Oh, absolutely. You. And how, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, one thing is, is to you know think real. You know, news is a very relativistic business, and that what is news depends on what else is happening at the same time. So if uh, and there are limits, and you know, particularly in, in uh, uh, at, at my publication, which is still a publication, also uh, in addition to being a website and a video operation and a radio operation and so forth. So there are you know limits of of time and space, both for the individuals who have to report it and, and edit it and so on, and then certainly for the newspaper and where it's going to going to fit. Uh, so yeah, this this has happened when the court has released significant opinions, several on the same day, uh, a case that might have been on the front page or very prominently covered mm -hmm. uh, gets uh, shriveled into into very little uh, because compared to the other case that day, uh, it's just not judged as significant and. For editors, and all of us have editors who are looking at what we do uh, uh, relative to all the other things going on in, in the universe, and they're going to say, "Okay, one Supreme Court story." That's that's the appetite of the audience for the Supreme Court. So, a case that might have been its own story had it come alone might end up as three paragraphs at the end of, of another story. And this is actually something that we have raised from time to time with the court that 
you know, at least be aware of the way these institutions operate, uh, you know, and, and they, have, they have said that uh, it, they don't, you know, that's not relevant to them. The, you know, uh, uh, the, we, you know we, will, we will release the opinion when it is cured to the perfect state of, of elegance and, and uh, uh, correctness, and we shall not hold it back one second later, uh, is what they say. Uh, but there is a consequence if part of the court's mission is to inform the public about what these decisions uh, mean. In a way, I think it's somewhat charming that the Supreme Court doesn't, uh, doesn't pander to the news media like perhaps the other branches of government do. Uh, you respect them for that. On the other hand, it is, as just said, a terrible when you two huge cases that you know, you know would get you on the front page of the paper or get you a huge amount of uh, space on the wire or time on the evening news come out the same day and you have to pick one. And you think, well, you know, those bums, if they had spaced them out a little bit, I could have been, do, I could do it twice. Uh, so we do have mixed feelings, and I do think they're somewhat attentive to this. I think they think about it a little, um, not as much as we'd like, and not as little as we sometimes think. But I think the challenge of covering the court has less to do with how the court's changed and a lot more how we've changed. Uh, Forty years ago, if you were covering the Supreme Court, and you were uh, a counterpart of Joan or Jess, the wire service, uh, you would not be sitting in the courtroom for decisions. You'd be in a little cubbyhole under the bench. And a colleague of yours up in the Supreme Court bench would take the opinions as they were literally handed down and stuff them into a little pneumatic tube. And it would thump down to Joan <laughs> under the bench, who would then start to write her story. Uh, and that would be the first word that anyone outside the Supreme Court would hear about a decision from the wire services. Perhaps, maybe, after a little while, from the major radio networks, maybe Mutual or UPI Audio, neither of which exist anymore. Um, that's so different now, because we all have to go rushing to our keyboards. Um, a for, a, for a wire service reporter, I guess it hasn't changed that much. They still have to get it out quickly. But for me, uh, when I came to work at NBC News, um, MSNBC.com didn't exist. Neither did our cable network, MSNBC. I worked only for Nightly News and the Today program. Well, those other two entities now consume an enormous amount of my time. And we're expected, for example, for the healthcare decision, to grab the decision and go running outside and immediately blurt out what we think this several hundred page decision means. Um, and we saw last year that uh, there were some problems along the line in <laughs> getting everybody to agree on what the decision said. It took a while. So those are the pressures I, 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 on us. I'm and gonna, and I, it's yeah. more of a change for us than it is in the court. That that's what's changed for us. I'm going to interrupt you only to compliment you, because I remember in Bush versus Gore watching uh, and, and going down the uh, uh, with the channel changer, trying to get to somebody who I thought might get it right on, on, on screen. And you got it right. You were the one who got it right. Well, uh, on, I, I on can only say, as I go back and look at the video now, I think, what a moron. What, you know, it should, <laughs> well, should have been well, much the, clearer than you made it sound. I, <laughs> well, the pressures are, are enormous to, and it was to, very to, cold. to get the uh, <laughs> to, to get the story out and to get it right. But so many got it wrong. But you knew where to look in the opinion. I think that comes really uh, from experience and having a beat, covering the Supreme Court as your beat. There's been a bit of a drop off in that regard, hasn't there? I mean, not as uh, Joan, you said that nobody leaves the, the beat, uh, at least voluntarily, but uh, there are, are- They have left not voluntarily because not, their publications have folded. Their yeah. budget constraints right. and, and uh, so there have been cutbacks and I think um, the, the, the coverage uh, has suffered a little bit, for, if not a lot, for, for, uh, for that reason. But uh, it, it is an enormous help, I think. Uh, I, I'm sure the three of you would agree to have it as a regular beat to, to, so you know where to look in the opinion for, uh, to, to get the, uh, uh, the, the right story. Well, as some of these people out here who are from different places in the country uh, that might have, used, might have had like the Knight Ritter chain there, the Chicago Tribune Knight Ritter Empire used to have individual reporters co covering it for the Baltimore Sun, covering it for the Hartford Current, covering it for the LA Times, covering it for the Chicago Tribune. Now essentially we have you know one or one and a half reporters doing it for all of the all the papers that were once part of the, uh, that empire. And Pete used to have several TV colleagues there also, on-air people and producers 
And now CBS has no presence up there, does it? Well, Jan Crawford. Uh, is she, but she's, she's a political she was, reporter Well, now, she's, she's she? back on the court. She, oh, she was there, okay. she was there yesterday. So there's, yeah. that's a good example that uh, she is back, but you know, it used to be regulars there all the time, right. whereas really it's, it's Pete, a uh, producer from ABC, right. uh, there the most. Wait, how do you prepare for, uh, with, with so many decisions coming up and down at, toward the end of the term, do you do a story ahead of time? Do you sort of uh, have your own predictions as to how it's going to come out and, and right ahead of time, how you think it might come out, and if you're right, great, beautiful, it's easy to, easier to publish, uh, or do you wait till the decision uh, it comes down before you, before you write? Pete, that's a, probably not, uh, it, 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 these are different questions uh, for those who write. In, if in you print. don't write, you're already late. <laughs> you know, because you ha I think we all do what, what's known in, for the old timers called B matter. You right. put together, uh, you put together the guts of a story, and I think all three of us probably have been in positions when we, where we wrote what we thought was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And actually, I did it the night of Bush v. Gore. For those people who were, you know, for all of us kind of paying attention to what happened that Saturday when they cut off the vote counts and everything, you could kind of at least guess at where they might be going and if, if you heard the oral arguments. But we would, none of us would have ever pressed the button on anything wrong. You would have, you would have just had enough material ready. Right. And, you know, we were discussing in the green room also the Prop 8 filing that might come today that um, Pete has already written about and put on, uh, put on their site. You know, all of us have versions prepared of what mm -hmm. we think might happen just because you, you know that time will be, you'll be under such time constraints that you want to have part of it at least done. And do you prepare those versions based on your own sense or oral arguments or what goes into your own preparation of, of uh, the article ahead of time? Well, you know, because there now have to be several versions of the story. I mean, as, 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 as Joanna indicated, there is, uh, for, you know, for very significant decisions, we need to have something on the website uh, in almost immediately after uh, the opinion comes down, because readers now expect it. They expect mm -hmm. to read it on their phones and so forth, and we <laughs> want to give them, you know, that's, that's why they subscribe, uh, we hope. Uh, and so uh, there'll be a, a sort of the, a, a, a quick version where most of the, the background material may be very similar, if not exactly uh, identical to uh, the walk-up story, the preparatory story, where there's mm -hmm. a lot of background to mm -hmm. where the, what, what the case is about, and then one can you know, quickly write a few paragraphs to put on top that says how it came out, and then the background there informs it. And so that, that would be the early version, and then I would uh, re return to you know, actually read the opinion and uh, try to write a more <laughs> comprehensive uh, piece that would go up on the website later and in the following day's paper. Are, are oral arguments a good predictor of, of, of the three of you? What's your experience there? Do you, do you get a sense after oral argument about how decisions come, are going to come out? I'll tell you that some of us do and some of us don't. And I'll <laughs> give you the healthcare care example. Uh, I went out to our vast uh, cable audience <laughs> after the health care case and said I thought that the Obama law was probably in serious trouble after listening to the healthcare arguments. Uh, Joan and I were together on another program later in the week. I predicted it would be struck down. Joan predicted that it would be upheld, and guess who was right? <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it's, I think, I think you oftentimes get a pretty good idea. Um, you can't account for what may happen once they get in and start writing the decision and maybe realign, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it depends on the complexity of the case, too. Some it's really obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you can get a pretty good sense of it, don't you, Jess? I think that uh, in those instances, I think most of the, most of the cases, uh, you can call with some confidence uh, with the, uh, after the oral argument. Uh, you know, many of the justices, again, this is, a, uh, I guess, a virtue of, uh, of being there a while. You sort of, you, you learn you know, what they're going after and what it sort of signals. And you also are familiar with what they've written before on related matters. So it's, it's, it's an educated guess. And then there are some things that are just, that are statistically true as researchers have found that uh, the more questions that they ask, the more hostile they are to that side. I mean, <laughs> they ask questions of the people they disagree with uh, unless they feel they have to run in to help someone they agree with who's floundering uh, at, at oral arguments. So I'd say that, that very, uh, of the, most of the time, at least I think I can call it, and I think that's true for most of my colleagues uh, there, and, uh, and, w 
and, and when we feel that way, uh, maybe once or twice we've been wrong, but almost always it's right. But there are many cases where you say, I can't exactly call this one. I mean, healthcare was very difficult to call, uh, and, uh, and our judgment that it was difficult to call was vindicated <laughs> by, the, by what ultimately we had. <coughs> I'll say. You know, I'll just mention something about collegiality and what I think uh, is very intellectually stimulating about this beat is we'll get to June and we'll have, for example, like the voting rights case still out. We'll probably have at least, we'll probably have both of the, um, uh, the DOMA and same-sex marriage case out, cases out. And what, what we will do is we will sort of talk to each other a little bit, and then we'll talk to other people who were in on the oral arguments and you know, law professors or sources of ours who we think are really smart and say, you know, I'm sort of thinking at this point that they might do this. What do you think of that? And, and actually, I enjoy doing that. I really like enjoy playing out the scenarios and that helps guide mm -hmm. you know, the, what we're thinking about. And you know, again, even today as we were, we've been thinking about what will all be in the administration's brief on the Prop 8 case, it's been, it's been fun to sort of play out different scenarios and it's, been, it's helped expand my own idea of what they might say even though they, you know, it might turn out differently. And I think that's what keeps us all going is that it is very intellectually stimulating and again, nobody presses the button until we actually see it, or at least among the three of us. <laughs> we're never gonna, we are never gonna go out on a real limb. Right. Any big the best example, I just wanna say, the best example that really looking back at the healthcare case, I mean, the preparation for that opinion, I mean, we had these sort of, you know, matrices of this could happen on this issue, and you know, we had, we had like, for that case, which not, wasn't just me, many of my colleagues at the paper also uh, were involved in, in preparing for that because it had so many implications, but we had, you know, I think we had 10 different versions of the story ready to go, depending on what combination of rulings they, they made. Right. Uh, so sometimes there is a lot of preparation that goes into that. I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Do you link to the actual opinion now? Can you yep. do that in your story so yep. that the reader can actually do yep. the opinion now? Or? Well, and that's another thing that's changed about covering the court, as you also well know. It used to be, when I started covering the Supreme Court, uh, the only way to read the briefs was to go to the Supreme Court building and get them from the clerk's office and uh, the public affairs office, which has a complete set of briefs for us downstairs, and sit there and read them all or uh, use the uh, photocopy machine in, in the press room and make copies and take them back to our offices and read them. Uh, that's not necessary anymore. It used to be for a while that the merits briefs, which is to, to say the briefs that the lawyers file themselves on why they should win and why the other guy should lose. Uh, it used to be that those were available online, but now all the briefs in, in all the cases are available online. Every single brief. The petition asking the court to take the case, the uh, amicus briefs on both sides, you can read all that online. Uh, and that's just a huge change for the public and for us. Uh is, is it, what, what, any big surprises? I mean, you, I, as you go, as, you, as you've prepared, what's the biggest surprise uh, decision in, in your experience? You, you, you mean decisions well, that are and, and I, I'd say you, the way the justices come out too. Are, how predictable um, are, are justices on uh, where they'll come out on a decision? I think that, uh, I mean, it does depend uh, a lot on the type of case because they have different degrees of interest and, 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 and uh, passion and, and uh, uh, consistency on, on different issues. So there are some cases that, uh, that some justices or some areas of law that they are really, really committed to and interested in and have a particular thing that they're, they're pursuing and others maybe that they're less interested in and more open to, to persuasion. So that changes a bit from, from, uh, you know, from case to case. Uh, but uh, most of them, I mean, it, it, I mean, I even remember when I, was in, when I was in law school and like reading court opinions, and then the first time I actually attended a, 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 an oral argument in, in, uh, in uh, late 99 or early 2000, and what really surprised me was how the justices at oral argument were exactly as I had imagined they would be. I mean, you know, their, their, their personalities and what they were interested in and how they sort of framed issues were what I would have expected from, from, from reading their, their work uh, previously. So, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, not, not to pull back the curtain too much, but in the argument story I w worked on yesterday, uh, uh, and I had to go to some uh, 
dinner thing in the evening and the version of the story comes back to me and there are a lot of questions and things that are inserted by the editors in New York and there was a tremendous, there was like this thing about like this, this new paragraph that said that you know, the questions that they ask are you know, maybe you know, wholly unrelated to how they will vote and are not necessarily <laughs> indicative of, of how they're leaning. Someone had, had, had put that in and I said, no, no, actually the questions they ask are completely indicative <laughs> of how they're leaning. <laughs> And you know it's not a guarantee, but uh, but I, I don't I mean I think that will confuse the reader by creating a greater level of uncertainty than is justified as long as we're clear that you know they haven't made their decision yet. I mean there is they can do whatever they want, but trying to give them our best uh, you know judgment of of where they're going uh, would be undermined by inserting this uh, this uh, information this irrelevant uh, statement uh, and. <laughs> Uh, furthermore, uh, it being still, even though we're multi-platform, the, the paper version is the, is the centerpiece, it means something else has to leave the story. And there was nothing else you know, for some kind of generic disclaimer that you know, future events have not occurred until they occur <laughs> was not, to me, worth taking out anything else from, from the article. Um, I will say that I was quite surprised by the health care case, and I, I want it noted for the record that I was absolutely right that they did not uphold it based on the Commerce Clause, which is what I said in the first place. Um, but I think, you know, the holding in the case was, you know, upholding it based on the taxing authority was interesting. The alignment was interesting. Um, having the Chief Justice uh, write the opinion was interesting. <laughs> Everything, I mean, surprising. Uh, everything about it was surprising, I think, to Here. everyone but Joan, <laughs> who apparently had this story written several years ago. But, um, so that, that was a big surprise. Um, the, um, the, the other big surprise was the, the, everyone forgets we had Bush v. Gore, but before that we had Bush versus Palm Beach County Canvassing Board, which was actually handed to us during oral argument. You remember what the case was? The uh, Butterfly. woman who was the seat belt case. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the, the question was of whether a yeah. uh, mother driving down the street in was it Lago Vista, Texas, yeah, or something. Yeah, Atwater versus something. something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was um, she was driving down the street, didn't have her kids seat belted. Yeah. They, the question was whether they could arrest her and take her down to the police station, which they did, and the Supreme Court said yes, they could. But it was during the oral argument that I think is yeah. Ed Turner in the building here because yes. Uh, yeah, Ed right. Turner was then. Uh, working in the press office, uh, earning an honest living, <laughs> and he uh, came down and handed us the opinion while we were looking, listening to oral argument, and I, I looked at him and I thought, what, the, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he hands the opinion, oh my heavens. So that was a surprise even when it came out. Uh, well, uh, it's, your experiences are, uh, are, are fascinating, and the court's lucky to have people on the beat, I think, covering it uh, uh, routinely. Uh, how would your job um, be different today. When I first started working at the Supreme Court, it was 1975, and Chief Justice Berger's office, and they um, had about 160 oral arguments a year in those days. Uh, now it's somewhere between 80 and 90, generally. Um, how much more of a challenge would your job be um, would have been in those days uh, covering the court. Jim, we try to keep that a little secret from our bosses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because every now and then somebody will say, boy, I, I just read that the, the calendar has really shrunk, that they're not hearing as many cases. Yeah, they're not, but they're really big cases. <laughs> big, 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 important cases. I, I don't know how our colleagues did it. In fact, I think back to, I think the last day of 1987 when not only did they get all these very complicated cases, including one of the big voting rights ones, that's when Lewis Powell resign mm -hmm. uh, from the bench. So, you know, you sort of, we all find ourselves incredibly busy and we find this to be a very challenging beat, but we're really handling only half of the material that our predecessors did. Although, as many of the justices make the point that even though they're doing fewer cases, they seem to be writing more. Mm -hmm. And more, definitely more and more briefs are coming in. So, uh, it, it's really amazing what people used to do. I think it was, I think the high point, what do you think, in the mid-80s, it was uh, up to about, a you know, 150 yes. uh, signed opinions coming down. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but again, I we think, you know, the compensating fact is that the pressures of our business have changed. I remember Linda Greenhouse, who covered the Supreme Court for 30 years for the New York Times, told me this story about one of her predecessors whom she didn't name. But she said his, and perhaps you all know who it is, I don't, but she said that this predecessor of hers at the New York Times would, on Supreme Court decision days, come in, 
get the decisions, go home, read them, open a bottle of wine, <laughs> make some phone calls to law professors and experts, uh, think about it for a while, take a little walk, and then write the stories at so 5 or 6 o'clock that evening. Well, you know, <laughs> those days, that, that person wouldn't last very long if they did that now. We usually start drinking the wine around 8 a.m. <laughs> You spoke, Joan, of um, the justices writing more um, with fewer opinions. They're writing more off the bench, too, it seems. Uh, <laughs> many more uh, books are coming out. Does that make them more accessible uh, to you as journalists, uh, as, as a general matter? And, well, and certainly as, as, as Jess and I know, if you have a book to sell, you'll talk to anybody. Right. And, and they will. And they'll go on, you know, just think of we have Exhibit A in front of us. Uh, uh, just as Sotomayor was on, uh, on 60 Minutes, she was on all the talk shows, she's out there, she's, she's happy to have an audience. Uh, Justice Scalia, when he's done his books, uh, that's when he'll say, yes, bring the cameras in. Mm -hmm. When he's not doing books, he do doesn't necessarily want that. So it makes them accessible, and what we will often do, and I think all three of us have done it, is if somebody has a book coming out, we'll go to talk to them, you know, and it's to talk to them about the book, but then we'll also throw in some questions. For example, when Justice O'Connor uh, had one of her books come out right after Bush v. Gore, well, you're going to go in there and you're going to ask her about Bush v. Gore, and she'll say, don't ask me about that, and you know, <laughs> she'll do her thing, but you it's will anyway. Good. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> spending a lot of time with her. But, uh, but the point is that it has made them accessible in a certain way. It's not like we're all getting great you know, information. It's just that it, it puts them out there. And it, it does us a service for our readers, because remember, there's no cameras in the courtroom, so a lot of people don't really know what these justices are all about, and it gives, you know, now people are very much interested in Justice Sotomayor, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, no, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, it, I mean, so, I mean, I mean and, and there's a reason for this, is that, you know, covering other institutions, whether they are, uh, you know, government entities or, or even, even uh, corporations, uh, there is a lot that those institutions and people in them want from the news media. I mean, politicians want to get reelected. They want to get their policies passed. They, they need us in a certain way. Even when I covered the UN, I was surprised at how integral the press was to what went on in that building, even though they're not elected uh, officials, because they uh, had certain messages they would send to each other through the press. There were, there, there were all kinds of reasons why the, the, uh, the, the news media was was part of their own kind of uh, 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 you know intestinal tract. Uh, while the Supreme Court is different because of you know the life tenure and their uh, uh, you know remote uh, 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 personas uh, traditionally, they don't need uh, the news media the way that other powerful people and institutions do. But when they've got something to hawk, it, it all changes. Uh, because that <laughs> suddenly they do need us because they need to get out, you know, they got to move some product and free media is uh, a lot, you know, more valuable uh, to them than when all they're moving are their ideas and, you know, legal opinions and so forth. So that, that changes the power dynamic somewhat uh, and it does mean that they then, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, uh, editors might say, you know, have to, have, to, have to show a little leg in order to get uh, attention. <laughs> <laughs> Are there um, different challenges in TV coverage uh, than in the print? It's much media harder, TV? Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be, I'm sure, much more intelligent to do that. Well, it's <laughs> well, apparently not. Uh, is the answer to that question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I, I now am, am somewhat uh, divided in in how I spend my time because I do actually write complete sentences now. <laughs> for the web, uh, but on the television side, sure, because uh, it's, it's just a simple matter that we're just so much more compressed. Uh, yesterday's story about the arguments on the whether to uh, uphold the constitutionality of part of the Voting Rights Act, which got you know many, many, many inches uh, in the newspaper, a long story for Jess, a um, long wire story for Joan. Uh, for me on NBC Nightly News, the total amount of time uh, I suppose with our anchorman Brian Williams' intro, uh, my live bit into and out of the tape piece, the tape piece itself, I suspect the total amount of time on the newscast was around two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. So in that time, we have to explain what the Voting Rights Act is, how it came to be passed, uh, 
who the challengers are, what the arguments they're making against it, what the justices said about it, what the outcome is likely to be, and what would happen if, if it is, in fact, modified by the court. So, you know, we're much more compressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other thing, as Joan mentioned, is there is no, there are no cameras there. So we have to have sketch artists uh, who sketch the justices as they speak, uh, which is, I guess, sort of, on the one hand, unbelievably charming, and on the other hand, bizarrely, uh, you know, antiquated. Um, I know as a fact that, that's, that there are no, going to be no cameras on the Supreme Court during my working career covering the court. Uh, we had hopes that maybe with younger justices coming on, they might have a different view. Uh, we've apparently seen that that changes, because during their confirmation hearings, both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan said, oh yeah, that sounds good to me, and now that they're on the court, they think, Probably it's a terrible idea that the barbarians <laughs> would be at the gate. So, um, it, you know, it, 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 it is a challenge. We have a large audience, and, you know, I think we have some obligation to, at least in whatever little way we can, pass along what are the, you know, what's at the heart of the case? What are the arguments? What are the legal issues? And that's, I, I must say, that's what bugs me a little bit about as journalism becomes ever more abbreviated. Uh, everybody always wants to look past them. You know, okay, well, they made the decision, so what does it mean? Well, wait a minute. What did the decision say? Why did they decide the case that way? I think that's terribly important. And, you know, I think the challenge for all of us uh, and for Supreme Court fellows as well is, you know, this is clearly the least understood branch of government. And very few people understand how the Supreme Court works and what it does. And so I think we always have an obligation to do a little teaching in our stories as best we can about, you know, why is it, why would it be unconstitutional? What are the constitutional issues? And to try to, as, as I can, to wedge that, that nutritious bit into the sandwich as much as I can. And, and yet even the printed uh, media is very condensed, uh, a condensed version of the opinions. And isn't it a challenge for you as well to uh, it, perhaps less so, uh, given Pete's time constraints on air, but to get the nuances of an opinion. And how do, how do you meet that challenge? I mean, it, you have to simplify it for the reader, for the lay reader, because not I mean, your audiences aren't simply lawyers, but uh, uh, the lay reader uh, needs to understand the issue. Do you find, is it, is it uh, easy to miss the nuances, or do you have to ignore them, or how, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, you know, again, that, that is sometimes a, a creature of, of time. For the first version of the story, they'll say, will you know, come out, you know, 10, 30 a.m. or so after the opinions are released, there will be fewer nuances in it. And the idea when, you know, re revisiting the story and rewriting it, you know, having then sort of read it and thought about it, perhaps talked to others about it or looked at some of the background information of the case, then to try to bring those out in the final version of the, of the story. And mm -hmm. in fact, that's, that's, there is a little bit of, um, of a uh, pain in that because most, the people who are most interested in these topics will read the first version and mm -hmm. they won't come back and they won't, you know, they won't say, hey, you know, you, it doesn't have a little banner saying, and come back at 4 p.m. for <laughs> the improved version. <laughs> uh, so, so the first version has to be good too, but, um, but yes, that is really where more of the, the nuance and context and also uh, for, you know, the people who will get the stories online, links to prior stories. And that's one way to try to get that in there uh, is to sort of point them to our prior coverage of the same uh, issue or related issues. Uh, another thing, you know, related is that I think that all of us are, are facing uh, some convergence in the ways we tell these stories because Pete is, now he has to write stuff for the NBC websites, but uh, even in the, <coughs> the print press, I have to think about visual ways to tell the story as well because there's now a huge video operation at the Wall Street Journal that actually runs a bunch of what are effectively TV news shows all day long on the website. And so before I came over here, I got a request, can I appear on the four o'clock news hub show to talk about the Prop 8 brief that may or may not be filed today? And, mm -hmm. you know, Cluck, thanks for the excuse. I said, no, mm -hmm. uh, but I can't do it, prior commitment. <laughs> but the, uh, so, so I have to think that way. And, and the other way to try to, again, bring out some of these, uh, so, uh, some of the, the nuances uh, is to, uh, uh, you know, point, 
point, the implication, point out the implications for other issues and other things going forward. And that, I think that's true in all news organizations. It's always been uh, something that the, the, the Wall Street Journal has tried to do is to try to have a very forward-looking spin. I mean, they, they're very proud of their, their, their front page on December 8th, 1941, which said, U.S. industry gears up for major challenge. You know, like, you know there's their whole thing about, about Pearl Harbor was its impact on the industry and what they could expect more government spending on and which industries would benefit and that kind of thing. So they really were instead of what happened yesterday. So uh, that, I think, is, a, is another way. So look for clues about future things. And, uh, and just to give an, an example, one of the cases I think we all focused on a lot was uh, 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 the um, U.S. v. Jones case last year, which is the GPS tracking device case. Uh, and what, what does this say about the way the court may look at other kinds of uh, technological surveillance issues that come up in the future, although that dealt with a particular type of surveillance that might be obsolete in a few years given other things that are going on. Uh, you know, the justices seem to in, you know, lay out some of the framework they were applying to this uh, issue, which will continue to be very important. And so that was, I think, something that we, you know, I, I tried to focus on uh, for you know, its significance. Has uh, oral argument changed uh, much in your experience over the years? Has it improved the, the advocates before the court? Has it improved? Uh, there, there seem to be more specialists these days, uh, advocates who appear more frequently. Um, and, and certainly uh, back in the mid-70s with 160 oral arguments, you had many, uh, many more advocates before the bench. But uh, there are seem to be more, a, a more uh, of a focused Supreme Court bar, if you will, uh, than in years past. Has that been your observation as well? Joan? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, almost all the big firms now are trying to have a piece of the action, mm -hmm. as the action itself has diminished in terms of the number of cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, there certainly is a band of regulars and- uh, Does that improve the quality of argument, do you think? Well, uh, I think, you know, probably generally yes, although things are very individualistic and sometimes somebody who has handled the case from below might be better able to address some nuances. Uh, but it, it is obviously a, a special kind of advocacy. It's not like being a trial litigator. It's, uh, you know, being an appellate advocate and understanding the justices and being able to address the justices and uh, from the most basic things of not getting them mixed up, mm -hmm. but also also knowing what to play to. And uh, uh, that is certainly a trend that we've all observed over the years. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and the justices themselves are, are partly responsible for that. Some of them have said that you know, when they look at cert petitions, if they recognize the, the, uh, the, the lawyer's name and they have a regard for that lawyer, they're more likely to take it. And so there's a kind of, uh, I mean, they themselves are almost grooming this, uh, this uh, small, uh, relatively small circle of, 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 uh, of uh, specialists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, more questions? So you, you referred to a rather hot bench uh, generally. Uh, more questions from this court than in years past? Oh, without question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, the newer justices are less shy. You know, there's a tradition when you're a freshman member of Congress, you're supposed to hold back and not leap to the Senate floor your first day. And I guess maybe that was true for the Supreme Court for a while, but I think about watching Justice Ginsburg come on and sort of slowly get into it. But boy, Justice Sotomayor uh, is one of the most aggressive, active questioners on the bench. Justice Kagan, too. So. Yes, I think, that's, I think that's definitely the case. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people lay it with Scalia in 1986 when he came on, and uh, a little bit of it was what uh, some folks describe as the law professor phenomena. Mm -hmm. Even though he came from the D.C. Circuit, he had been a law professor and he had questions, and uh, there's a great story, uh, a true story, that Lewis Powell turns to Thurgood Marshall and says, you know, does he even think the rest of us are here? <laughs> you know, because he's talking so much. But I, it, <laughs> you know, from that, then on, uh, it seems like anybody who came on was a, more talkative than uh, the predecessor. Mm -hmm. and, and Justice Ginsburg, too, you know, uh, again, somebody who had law professor background, and she, she comes so prepared to oral arguments. She's just right in there. And, uh, and Justice Kagan, in the beginning, I think she laid back a little bit. She, her style, I would say, is to kind of listen and see where the ar arguments are going and then very strategically enter a case, whereas... Justice Sotomayor, the next most recent justice, 
really pounds away a lot at the facts. And she happens to be uh, the only one on the bench now who came from, who had been on a trial court and had been a, uh, so she was, she's very much interested in the record and will we'll pick away at uh, what happened below mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give the, uh, the fellows and uh, the audience a chance to ask some questions. Um, and now might be a good time to, to break for that. Uh, I don't know if there's a mic available or if you just want to stand up and, and um, ask a question if you have any of our, of our panelists. Two microphones, one for each side here. If you'd come down, please. Great. As they're approaching the mic, uh, do you still have uh, uh, an annual meeting, off the record meeting with the chief? I know they used to do that in years past. Uh, or if it's off the record, you can't say anything. Well, let me just say that uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist so loved us that he had lunch with us once every two years. <laughs> um, uh, Chief Justice Roberts has uh, done it more frequently, shall yeah. we say. Okay. That's off the record. <laughs> well, those, those, uh, those are good conversations, I know, from years past. Yes, sir. Last November, I took a uh, public tour of the court. And I was advised that if I wanted to see the court in action, that I should pick a cold February morning and get in line about 8 o'clock. I did that two weeks ago, uh, but unfortunately for me, there was a Monsanto case so that wow. just a few people could get in. I was able to see the court for five minutes, but can you offer any advice on how to pick a time to go uh, see the court, I must say. a better one for you. <laughs> it was a thrill to see him even for five minutes. Well, if it's a very high profile case, one that gets a lot of publicity, there, there, there are some very important cases that don't necessarily get a lot of uh, publicity. And uh, if you follow it closely and have uh, some interest in, in the court's work, uh, you can spot those from time to time and you can, you can get in and, and hear the arguments uh, uh, fairly easily, but for the higher profile cases, it, uh, it is a bit of a challenge sometimes. Yeah, bring a sleeping bag, get there the night before. Right. <laughs> Actually, Mondays are good days. Mondays tend to not have as many big cases on them, so try a Monday at 11. <laughs> My name's Li Yang. Uh, I think recently the justice of what Reaping Man uh, Anybody have have a improper comments, racism or something of the sort? And I know Justice Ginsburg has one time scolded at a just uh, uh, attorney who didn't really represent the complainant that well. So I, my question is whether the Supreme Court now will be really getting more aggressive to reprimand whoever whichever party, including the Department of Justice, improper handling of the cases, and maybe they get along dragging the complainants and very rarely. financially. That very rarely happens that, I mean, they might, if, if the court feels that advocates didn't do the right job in representing their clients, they might zing them in the opinion. But to have a justice during oral argument on the bench say, you know, uh, Mr. Williams, you're, you're really doing a terrible job here, uh, yeah. and you're a disservice to your client. Boy, I don't know, maybe I've seen that happen once. It's very rare. Barbara? Yes, thanks, Jim. Um, I wondered if the panel would comment on the stories that circulated at the end of the term last year <laughs> after the, uh, the health care case came down about possible leaks that had occurred about whether the chief had changed his vote possibly from one position at conference to another when the case was handed down. And the reason I ask is, as Pete pointed out, leaking and the court are not two words that usually go together. Right. <laughs> um, I wonder if some of the court officials here would comment on that. Um, well, I have mixed feelings about that. Number one, it wasn't my story, so I'm very upset. Number two, <laughs> you know, my, 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 I'm going to give you a long-winded answer in case you hadn't, couldn't tell. Uh, what bothered me about the way that story was reported in the totality uh, gets back to the point I made earlier about how little the Supreme Court is understood. At the end of the day, who cares? Uh, you know, you could certainly take the position that what matters is what the opinion says, how the court, the case was decided. It's not 
unprecedented for justices to change their minds after oral argument. Um, it does seem pretty, there are certainly lots of things that would lead you believe that there was some realignment, as I said earlier, uh, as discussions went along. I mean, the opinion itself suggests that. It's organized in a very odd way that if you were sitting down to write it that way from the beginning, you probably wouldn't. Um, and there are lots of other reasons to think that's the case. But I guess, you know, number one, as I say, it's interesting. But at the end of the day, so what? But back to your point about how seldom the court leaks. I mean, I don't know what the source was. I don't know if it was the court. I don't know if it was one of the nine justices. I'm relatively confident it was not an employee of the court. You know, you can now do the math and decide who's left that that could have been. I think we all have our, our suspicion about that. But you're right. The number of times that there have been leaks is extremely small. I think it, it, there's not been a leak since I've been covering the court in the last 20 years of a decision about you know, what a decision is going to be. There is a notorious case of one of my predecessors from ABC News, Tim O'Brien, reporting what the court was going to, how the court was going to, not only what the court was going to decide, but how it was going to vote. And it turns out that he was getting a tour of the building and he went into the conference room where the justices uh, have their conference, and he found a crumpled up piece of paper in the fireplace that was supposedly the, uh, somebody's notes about how the case was, case was going to be decided. So uh, the court has taken a lot of steps over the years to try to deal with leaks. It used to farm out the printing of the opinions. It does it in-house now. So, but yes, your, your main point is that that has, is exceedingly rare. <coughs> that uh, O'Brien uh, example, I think, uh it was in the late 70s, maybe? I that might have been the last time that the I think media, it is. The last Got a time tour? The media yeah. was in the uh, conference room of the, uh, uh, where the well, justices meet. What, for what I've read, though, is that uh, historically there were more leaks than there are today. That in prior generations and, and centuries, justices were, were actually more accessible to reporters. And from time to time, things would come out, including, you know, I mean, Dred Scott was actually a case that was leaked, the, uh, the, the vote account there and the ruling ahead of time and and but so undoubtedly softened the blow <coughs> in that case. Yeah. yeah right uh, so just just sort of, you know got, <laughs> got buried. Le leaked in those days meant people learned about it three weeks later instead of uh, you know, <laughs> two months later but uh, well, that's interesting I, I really I hadn't uh, heard and that I think either. you know given the court's interest in originalism that going back to that <laughs> Uh, tradition you know would be would be uh, you know perhaps appropriate corrective <laughs> Um, yes, let's go back over here and then we'll come back. Um, yeah, um, testing. I, I've, I've read the Constitution a few times and I've never been able to get a hold of a liberal constitution or a conservative constitution. With all the 5-4 decisions, apparently there must be a liberal constitution and a conservative constitution. But my real question is, as people who have listened to the arguments and read the briefs more than I have and, and read you know, all the stuff that the justices put out. Do you ever get the sense that somebody is paying attention to the Constitution and somebody else is just winging it? <laughs> well, if you ask the justices, you would get an answer about who's doing that. Asking which. you guys. <laughs> I think they all deal in good faith. You know, uh, uh, we all do make, for all of us who are um, uh, reporters who bring some analysis and authority and interpretation to pieces, we try not to make really hard judgments. But we tend to, you know, we'll, we'll at least give a certain cast to a story. But, you know, you, you can read anybody's editorial page and get the kind of reaction of uh, who's conservative, who's liberal, and who might have a really flawed understanding of what's in the Constitution. But I, I do think that for in most cases, and in all cases, the justices are, are dealing in good faith in how they uh, interpret the, the Constitution. And more importantly, I think that their colleagues actually think that. And what the justices have said is that they have to think that. They have to believe that um, even if they have sharp disagreements, that they come from a point of um, uh, respect for each other rather than that somebody's really uh, taking an ill-informed or malicious view of what's in the Constitution. Sorry. <laughs> and there are different schools of thought in many different fields, you know, where you can have 
you know, valid approaches or plausible approaches in, in you know, literature or theology or what have you. And I think that's really what it is. And remember, it's not just this Supreme Court, but all these cases have almost all have come from lower courts where a similar type of debate or divide has, has, has arisen. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Patricia Brooks. Um, I want to know, I, I'm certain that you all probably get a lot of special interest groups that call you um, trying to pitch to influence Supreme Court decisions. And I wanted to know what, how you incorporate that influence without jeopardizing the integrity of your coverage. And also, if you had any tips for people who um, are a special interest group and how they can communicate that across to you without <coughs> ruining a relationship or trying to seem too pushy. Well, remember that there's an institutionalized way for special interest groups to make their views known, and it's called amicus briefs. And so that's the first thing we look to. Uh, clearly, we want to hear from the parties to a dispute, but the next place we'll look is, uh, you know, what does the uh, ACLU think of this? What does the NAACP think? What does uh, the Heritage Foundation think? What does AEI think? What does Cato Institute think? So, you know, it's not what you say is not in any way illegitimate, it's part of a system. Um, and then, you know, I will say for me, uh, when I'm looking for an outside expert to add into a story, I'm looking for two things. An interesting point of view and someone who can speak English without sounding like the Federal Register. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of people in the, in the law community who can't do that, who cannot, who cannot answer a question without bringing up the doctrine of collateral estoppel. <laughs> and that just doesn't work for me on television. And so, uh, but I, I, I welcome those outside views, especially as Jess says, when we're trying to say, you know, look forward to how might a Supreme Court decision have an effect. Well, yeah, we're interested in the people out there who are in the vineyards of that uh, issue. So it's absolutely legitimate. Uh, and <laughs> yes, we do hear from them all the time. And when the big cases come along, like Voting Rights Act or health care, our emails runneth over. Do you, <clears throat> I don't think any of the three of you identify when you talk about a justice who appointed them, um, <laughs> which I think, I, I, I admire you for that. Uh, you know, that no, no, I do. A, do I know? often will, well, if it's why, relevant. Why, why is that if relevant? It's re if it, why is it oh, relevant? Oh, well, yesterday, when I happened so to I write. I admire two of the three of you, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yesterday, oh, well, here's a, in, in, not in a pejorative way, but in an uh, informational way. Happened to uh, do a story, uh, an, an analysis that focused on the strategy of Justices Sotomayor and um, Kagan as they were using oral arguments to target Justice Kennedy yesterday on voting rights. And it was important for me to say when they came on the bench and the fact that they had been appointed by President Obama. And I would think that that, you know, again, the Obama administration had a uh, uh, yeah, so in that, that case, that, that, but you're probably thinking when it's like a negative one and it says appointed by Nixon or <laughs> like something that's going to sound right, right. that somebody's going to put a, a, some sort of cast on it. Right. And, and I, that's, that's well taken. But I actually think that in many cases, it's information that's useful. And you, as reporters, we're always watching how we use information. And if it's used just to say, look at this guy, mm -hmm. we, we don't. Mm -hmm. but, but if it's helpful, I, I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also just very clear that it, that it is actually relevant from sometimes, not all the time. You, most stories know, but it is important for this as well because, I mean, uh, judicial appointments are a political issue. Presidents, uh, you know, take hits or gain uh, credit for who they appoint and what they do. Members of the Senate likewise do, and it is an issue. And so, how those are turning out uh, and what they might, you know, portend for future appointments by that president or conf confirmations by the Senate or that party or what have you, you know, readers should know it and you know make of it what they what they will. 